Hey, Hash and Hassan, how are you guys doing today? Very well, thank you. Okay, Good, so I've got both of you on the line here, all the way from London, and I really appreciate you guys could join me today. So as a starting point, let's start with the Hash. As a starting point, give our audience a brief background on your career before we get into some of the interesting points you want to discuss. For sure, yeah. So uh, I was uh, a failure in my family. There's only three things you could, four things you could do, either be a lawyer, yeah, doctor, family. engineer. yeah. Or a failure, and yeah. I was a failure. So I dropped out of uh, college and uh, decided to um, uh, start an internet company at the age of 19, selling uh, shoes on the internet. And that's how I got involved in the world of the internet. And I won an award for that uh, website. And uh, I began working in London for multiple different agencies, working on building websites. And um, at the same time, I was always doing some side hustles. Uh, I was always doing something on the side of building a website or trying to sell something. So I always had this entrepreneurial gene in me. And then eventually I landed the role of a marketing director of Just Eat, which uh, went on to IPO for 1.5 billion in the UK. I was the first marketing director there. And then I went on and built several different companies, invested in quite a few, coached and mentored lots of founders around the world. And now I've landed at building a company called UHubs, which is an online training platform for salespeople. Okay, that's very interesting. And yourself? Hassan? So for me, my background is uh, I started my first business, an online business, straight from after university. Um, I actually had a lot of trouble thinking about what I'm going to do as a career. And that was a whole you know, thing where I was like, am I going to be a doctor? I dropped out of medical school. Um, and essentially, I ended up kind of do, following the four hour work week lifestyle, you know, the yes. famous book by Tim Ferriss. Um, and that was like my goal. I was like, okay, this sounds great. I didn't want to get into banking because I was like, that was the typical yeah. path because I did economics. Once I dropped out of, of the medical path, um, I but I decided I didn't want to you know make all that money but not have the time to spend it, which is why yeah. I was drawn to this approach of like, okay, start a business, uh, serve clients, systemize and automate the business, let it run itself, make a passive income. And for the first two years of the business, let me tell you, it really was not passive. I was working yeah. crazy hours. <laughs> um, but I did get to the point where it was like I was able to sat, travel around Southeast Asia, uh, making money. My team were handling everything. And I, I was, to be honest with you, I was supposed to be traveling and working, but I wasn't really doing much. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just even procrastinating, sending out invoices. So one of the things for me is like passive income made me passive. So that was an interesting period in my life. It was during that time I met Ash. And uh, we started to invest in tech startups. And from the insights we got from doing that process and getting pitched is how we put together our book and our concept of the unfair advantage. Um, so now I'm a business coach. Um, I work with a lot of creators, actually. So I'm big on the creator space, but also with the tech startup founders. And um, I really enjoy like the, the journey of like writing, sharing ideas, communicating, and sharing insights that I've learned on the business journey. So building on that, Asan, and I'll get to Ash's comments on this later. How do you know you have an unfair advantage? Everyone tells me they have an unfair advantage when they want investment, but how do I know it's a real unfair advantage that's sustainable? Mm, that's a great question. Um, unfair advantages, I think the best way, the best criteria to use um, is whether it's something that can easily be copied or bought by somebody else by like a competitor, let's say. In other mm -hmm. words, does it create a moat around the business? Is it something that's hard for somebody else to replicate, for somebody else to threaten their business with? Um, and often it's, it's about having a set of un unfair advantages, not just in that one yeah. person, but also across the whole founding team. And you have to look at all the different unfair advantages that they have, and that's what they bring to the table. And that's the best way to ascertain that. And you just have to see, is it something they can defend? Is it a mo? Do they have deep connections within an industry? Do they have a unique insight nobody else has had? Is their technology for some reason or their solution um, just a better mousetrap? Do they have the expertise to have made it work much, much better? These are the kinds of things that you'd ask and to figure out if it's a real unfair advantage. So Ash, building on that, it sounds like you're investing in the person. I mean, really, that's it. You're just looking at the person because they don't have anything. They, they have an idea, but you're really assessing the person. So the investment is, do I believe in this person? Is that a good way of thinking about it? I think um, uh, it's absolutely the way most uh, VCs and investors will think about it because there's nothing else tangible that you can go, go from. 
you know, there's not, not much traction. Um, there's not many, uh, uh, you haven't created the product yet and we can't see something or we can't see the customers. How else can you base it? You can only base it on the talent of the founder or the person who's starting the project. And the traits in founders are really important towards success of a um, new business, for example. And a lot of investors don't just look at the single founder. Um, they also look at the co-founders of the team because one founder by themselves doesn't always have all the strengths that are needed to build a business and get it going. Sometimes you, um, there's going to be a lot of founders who have spike in certain types of traits or have certain types of unfair advantage. And what we say in the book is, how do you know what your unfair advantages are compared to somebody else? And how do you combine those together in a team? So investors are looking at it from a team perspective and a people perspective first, because the people is what drives the business in the early days of starting something. So Ash, is it a fair thing to say that the more team members, the more unfair advantages you have, or is there some advantages to being a solo startup founder? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, most startups fail because of co-founder challenges and issues. And the reason what we talk about unfair advantages is that people don't know how to choose their co-founders in the first place. So the concept of unfair advantages allows you to be introspective and learn about what you have that's a strength and that puts you in a unique position in the marketplace and then build on your weaknesses with another co-founder to fill those gaps. Otherwise, what happens is that people decide to um, partner up with people and they've got very similar skills. And that's where the challenge happens. You might have two people in a team who are visionary, for example, and that might not work as well because you need someone to do the integration work, to do the actual execution work, and you're going to be stepping on each other's toes. So it's really important to identify your personal unfair advantages and then see what your strengths and weaknesses are, subject to what type of business you want to start. And that's where it becomes very interesting because you are looking at both the business and yourself. And what you're trying to do effectively is, um, it's like riding a bike. When you're riding a bike, you're getting lots of headwind hitting you. But if you've got tailwind behind you, that's what we call the unfair advantage. It's like you're going in the flow. It's going to speed you up towards your success. And that's what you need to discover first as a team. So that's interesting. So Hassan, let's think about this a little bit, right? Let's assume we have a group pitching you guys for some money, whatever it is, $2 million, 2 million pounds to invest in some startup. And there's four members of the team here. So if I understand this thinking correctly, you'd look at the four people and say, is there a value in having these four people? Do they bring four complementary unfair advantages? Or is it just four people because these guys were friends in college and they're trying to not mm. alienate anyone? Yeah, that's a good question. It's not the first line of inquiry. Yeah. I wouldn't, that's not the first thing I would think about. But yeah, that is one of the kind of later considerations. I think the first thing you look at when you're getting pitched to startup is, does this make sense? You yeah. know, does this usually like one of the biggest things about pitching is actually just clarity. Yes. Like often you can just get caught up going, wait, what is this? Yeah. Sorry, I don't understand what this startup yeah. is. And it's surprisingly often that yeah. it's just not communicated clearly enough. So that's number one. Number two, is it a large enough market? Is it an actual problem that they're solving? Is it a large enough market? It's like the intensity of the problem and also the breadth or the com how common the problem is. Yes. So the total addressable market is very important. Does the solution make some sense? Do we have some validation that the solution makes sense that they've come up with? So that's kind of the business idea. So the idea is important. It's a bit like the analogy of the jockey and the horse. You know, do you, the horse is like the idea yeah. that the business is and the jockey is the, the startup founder or founders. And basically, I would say that it's hard to judge. Like a good idea is actually not always obviously yeah. a good idea. You're often going, oh, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. The others didn't work. So you can't judge it based on the idea. So you judge it based on the founders. And that's when you start to think about the founders. But first, you just want to sense check it all. First, you want to see, does this make sense? Who is yeah. it targeting? Is it doing all the basic thing? Then you can look at the, okay, do they have, the, uh, is this the team to do it? If this is real, yes. if they've identified the right thing, they have the right insight, the right solution to the problem, they've got something unique there. Are they the right people to do it? Do I believe that they can do it? that's where the unfair advantage really comes into play. So from an investor side, that's when it comes into play. As a founder, how it comes into play is more in the sense of, do I think we can do this? Can I do this? Who can I bring with me as a co-founder? Can I com convince investors, let's say it's a startup that needs investment. Can I convince investors to be on board with this? Can I then hire? Often it's just all about communication at that point. 
So it's very important that the idea and the product, you know, problem solution is right. And we have that kind of, in terms of unfair advantages, the insight and the expertise, the insight is the problem and the expertise is where you can solve the problem. So that, that's the kind of mental model I would use to look at it. Yeah, I like that answer. And Ash, for the listeners in here, how would they go about determining their unfair advantage if they have one? Firstly, everybody has unfair advantages. And uh, in the book, we've created a framework called the Miles Framework. And um, you have to have a look through the Miles Framework to identify in each one of those pillars that we've created um, in the Miles Framework where you feel you have an unfair advantage or a particular advantage that you could take advantage of. Um, for example, um, some of the things that are quite interesting when it comes to starting a company or even becoming really good at making a long-term business success is to have adversity in your life and turning that into an advantage. And so it's really important to know who you are as your story and then utilizing that to develop yourself further um, and understanding the gaps that you might have um, in your ability to create a business. And so the book has a core framework for the Mars framework, but everything sits on top of what we call um, the growth mindset. Mm-hmm. So it starts off initially having the right mindset and having a growth mindset to be able to clarify what unfair advantage you have. So we start off with have in the book about talking about the reality growth mindset, how you should develop that first before you start to think about which particular unfair advantage you have. So you know how to spin the unfair advantage in your favor. Um, so in the, the Mars framework is in the book and it stands for money, intelligence, insight, location, luck, education, expertise, and status. And when you talk to founders or guys pitching you, do you find your role is looking for who has a grasp of their unfair advantages or helping the founders determine what that is? Where does the boundary lie? How deep are you involved in that? I think most uh, good founders yeah. have a natural self-awareness. Developing your unfair advantages but developing your own self-awareness of what your strengths and weaknesses are. And I think um, uh, honesty and integrity is very important when you're going to pitch your startup or looking for investment and dealing with your customers as well. The book gives you a, a, a way to look at through a lens to discover your own unfair advantages, but also to discover other people's unfair advantages yes. and to hire the right people in your team. So we're looking for that self-awareness in founders to say, actually, I've hired this person or this person's on my team for this reason. Uh, and because I'm really good at this and this person's really good at what, one of my weaknesses. And um, when you're starting a business, we always say that it's easy to build a business nowadays, but it's really hard to get distribution and traction so we focus a lot on people who can actually get to market and go to market with their product or service. Yes. And those are the unfair advantages we're looking for. So Asan, building on this, one of the things I've seen, and I'm obviously working on a much smaller sample set than you guys work with, we tend to have a lot of MBA clients who are going to consulting firms, but a fairly big number of them want to launch startups at university. And I would say about 25% end up doing it. But a lot of them have extreme confidence. I mean, they're just naturally confident. Even if they have no advantage, they can find a way to pitch something. How do you separate people who are just charismatic and gifted and are confident, and, but they're trained to speak in a certain way, but there's no unfair advantage that they've identified? How do you separate that? Because for me, that's always been difficult when being able to dig behind what's being said to see if it's built off a solid base. Mm, this is a good question. You know, that, that's really what you're describing is really common with like, MBA yeah. <laughs> grads. Um, so basically, this is key. Often that there is there's two types, and we discuss this in the book. There's two types of founders, and often this is, or let's say, there's two different roles within a startup. Let's say it that way. You have the visionary kind of entrepreneur. This person is more often. This is the communicator. This is the person who has big ideas, not very detail oriented, usually not very technical. And this might fit the role of the MBA kind of person. Mm -hmm. And then you have the the other role, which is the technician. And the technician is generally not going to be as charismatic. They're usually going to be like the engineer, the developer, the programmer, the CTO type. And with this person, they're not going to be super smooth and super charismatic. Now, when you are talking to an engineer, generally speaking, to make broad brush generalizations, if they are super charismatic 
and um, amazing speakers, then maybe you need to investigate how good of an engineer they might be. You just need to think about it. It's a bit of a red flag. It's like broad brush yeah. generalization. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because no, but genuinely, like even hiring. So even in hiring, yeah. when you look at, when you're hiring for a technical role and they are super smooth, super charismatic, amazing in the interviews. Let's say, um, let's say it's not a technical interview. Maybe it's for, it's for a technical role, but you're just do, do, interviewing them as, as yeah. a founder who doesn't have the technical side. You, they, I don't know. You should, you should think, hmm, okay, let me kind of dig more. Let me do some more due diligence. It doesn't mean that they're wrong. There are always yeah. exceptions and there are people who have multiple skills like that. And, and therefore, this isn't something that I would look for. However, if it's more of a communication role, let's say you're hiring a salesperson, let's say you're hiring a head evangelist, let's say you're literally, there is the visionary. Yeah. You do want to have that passion. You do want to have that charisma, the speaking skills, the, the presentation skills. So I would say it's an unfair advantage for when they're in that role. But if they were the the solo founder, I don't know, like you have to, you have to check, you have to do, that's where the due diligence comes in because um, really it's about solving problems. Ultimately a business is about solving a problem. If the problem is communication based, then that's good. So in summary, if it's a communication based problem and it's super smooth, then brilliant because they have an unfair advantage with that. But if it's not, then you have to think, okay, if they're that, you know, nobody's amazing at everything, right? So you have to see, okay, so are they, are they that good, let's say, as an engineer? So that's how I would usually look at it. So if you're like an MBA type, I would say you have to look for, and this is the most common advice me and Ash give, is yeah. you uh, a technical person, you need a technical co-founder, because this is going to be really hard. Let's say you're building an app or a website. Who's going to build that? You're going to hire an external agency, and then how are you going to iterate on that? It's going to be hard work. It's going to cost a lot of money. If you have somebody in-house, it's so much better. And it's usually the better thing to do. Um, but that begs the question of how do you find a CTO, which is a whole other problem. But, <laughs> but we'll start from there. Uh, I like that. That's good advice. Ash, do you have some examples of unfair advantages for the audience so they could conceptualize this? Because we we're talking about the principles, the building blocks, but we've not really shown a magnifying glass on an example yet. Yeah, I wanted to add on to the uh, previous question that um, uh, Hassan was talking about, about the MBA schools, because I've got quite a strong view about MBA, yeah. uh, MBAs themselves. Um, MBAs teach you to become polished in terms of giving presentations, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good business. And sometimes you need to look beyond the, uh, the style uh, and go to the substance. And how do you do that? What you're looking for in people is, people who've got insight, people who've got grit and humility, but also people who are coachable. So when a MBA comes and does a very polished presentation and you pick a uh, critique something in there, how do they react to that? You know, and there's a certain level of overconfidence and there's a certain level of arrogance. So you can kind of see that person and how you're going to work with them as well. That's really important, that coachability and that humility when it comes to being confident, because you can still be confident and it's a good thing to be confident. We tell everyone to be confident, tell a great story, have a great narrative, have a good polished pitch, but when you over polish it, you can just see straight through that because then they try and um, skip the most important parts, which are the insight, the grit about themselves and the coachability side. Um, so what was your next question? Michael? Oh, the next one was uh, some examples of unfair advantages in startups and business. So the audience can get their mind around how to think about this. Yeah. So, for example, um, insight is a massive uh, unfair advantage to most businesses. Um, we've got a case study in our book about uh, a lady called Sarah Blakey, mm -hmm. and uh, she designed a stocking that gives you a really nice silhouette. And the only way you come, with, come up with that idea is if you're a woman, right? Yeah. So the fact that she's a woman and she wants to dress nice and look good, she has had an unfair advantage into that space. A man wouldn't think of having the stocking that goes over your body to make you skinnier or look nicer with nice curves, right? Another example is uh, Tristan Walker. Tristan Walker founded a company called Bevel, which is a shaving uh, product for men, men of color because black men have curly hair. And he saw this problem for himself and goes, actually, there's no product on the marketplace that deals with this curly hair that black men have. Yeah. How can I develop a product for it? specifically. So that's actually an unfair advantage for him because he's got the problem, he's seen it, and it's unique to him as an individual. Those are just some examples, a couple of examples. So Asan, switching back to you, I have a question here. During this time, we've been talking about startups and smaller companies. And when you're a startup, for example, you don't have any legacy assets. 
So you do judge the individuals and look for the comparative advantage and unfair advantage with the individual. But I'm thinking about if we apply this thinking to large companies, it also makes sense. But the kind of discussions you have with large companies is that they often assume the unfair advantage lies in some physical product, some algorithm. And when you have leadership discussions, as we have with CEOs and CTOs and COOs, it's often a challenge to make them realize that they've got to look for the unfair advantages in the way the employees behave, conduct themselves, because they very quickly move into the assets. You know, we own this pipeline. Yeah, but do you have the engineering talent to bring the pipeline to 90% reliability? So what kind of advice would you guys have for people in industry, corporate using this advice? Because I think they're going to quickly default to looking at the physical assets. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's very, very important to not overlook the talent side. And a huge part of like big PR campaigns and all of this is actually to attract talent. Because one of the things that's very unscalable is the and very limited in just generally in the world when you have very specific needs for talent is there's there's a finite pool there isn't an infinite pool of talent in the world um i'm I'm talking when you have specific needs but broadly speaking the unfair advantage we often speak to corporates about this because it's, it's very big for them and the most classic way that they use this is in in how they do it in terms of like intrapreneurship So let's say they're doing a new product launch and they're trying to enter a new market or they have a a new team or a new squad working on a new business uh, or part of the business, let's say. They treat it as the best way they can treat it is as a startup, but bringing in the unfair advantages of the larger organization, you know, looking at where you can use the unfair advantages, let's say the brand, let's say some of the talent, some of the connections, some of the insight that the bigger organization has, but then to use that within the small teams and let them be a little bit more autonomous, let them behave as a startup and use a startup methodology. And within that team, again, look for unfair advantages on a personal level. And also at the same time, look at the organization's unfair advantages. Let's say, you know, their compet- you know, their sustainable competitive advantages, their brand power, et cetera and how they can leverage all of those. And again, looking at it holistically, as you suggest, to then, you know, approach a new market, attack a new problem, launch a new product, let's say. Yes. Ashley, do you want to add anything on this question? Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to management consultants um, and people working in the people industry, the unfair advantage is is in the people. Yes. Um, That's the asset. that, That is the key, right? But how do you know you know, we, we confuse competitive advantage with unfair advantage and competitive advantage is usually in the assets that you have. So it might be your customer database, your connections and what projects you worked on before and so on. But it's actually the people and what insights and what unfair advantage they have that will help the project go forward. And like Hassan says, treating it like a startup uh, and being agile in that process because you don't want to be uh, drowned out by all the, the corporate uh, way of doing things which slow things down. Uh, being a startup, everything is about growth and iteration and experimentation. And allowing this team to be able to do that will learn. You will be able to learn faster and produce better results. And I think that's where it's really important when you are looking at businesses and companies that you're working for as consultants. That actually there's an experiment experimentation phase that you go through uh, that allows you to become much more agile in the approach rather than agreeing on one project and then saying right. This, this is it, six months, and we're going to complete six months. But actually, in the first two months, your people might learn something. But because you've agreed a six-month project, it's just going to carry on. And those learnings aren't going to be incorporated. And that's a very important process of knowing um, your unfair advantages and utilizing the, what we'd say, the lean methodology of doing projects. You know, I was reading the book and listening to you guys here. I was thinking about how companies conduct performance reviews today. So once a year, once every quarter, they bring the employee in, they'll make a list of all the things that were positive, all the things that were needing work, they'll get feedback from colleagues and so on. But I was thinking, wouldn't a better way to conduct a performance review would be to simply focus on what your unfair advantage is and build that out and groom that in the person? How can companies use this? Because right now, when we're speaking, we're talking about giving advice and coaching face-to-face, but how do we... 
How do you formalize it? How do you take the principles and make it a part of the way companies manage employees? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. I, I think it all starts off with recruitment and onboarding and hiring. Yes. Um, I, I think there's a lack of uh, lack of diversity in hiring, for example, not just in um, people of color and gender and sexuality, but also intellectual diversity. Yeah, you know, you have companies who want uh, who are opening it. For example, you might have a a mobile bank and yeah. they're hiring for somebody from the banking experience, uh, banking background. But actually, you're developing a new idea completely. Why would you want someone from banking? Why don't you get yes. someone from a different different industry altogether that was developed a great app because you're looking for someone to develop an app. So diversity of, uh, uh, is really important. So it all starts off with uh, hiring the right people and then also onboarding them into the business. So many companies have a really poor onboarding program. How do you know what people's strengths are when you once you once you know what you're looking for in your team and you're looking for these other unfair advantages and diversity? How do you know how to bring them into the team? And that all happens through the onboarding process. Um, and onboarding is really important. I think a lot of companies get the onboarding process wrong, and people are falling off. And you know, there's a statistic that says that most people um, want to leave a job within the first week uh, once they know the onboarding if they've had a really bad experience. Of being onboarded yes you know they're already thinking actually it's not going to be right for me in the long term unless it changes so that's really important and i think the other part that's really important to um, uh, start to utilize people's unfair advantages is to upskill managers uh, managers and people who are managing other people they need to be coached with the right skills and they need to have the coaching skills uh, to bring out the opportunities in the people who want to grow and coaching skills are becoming new, uh, I, I think the new things that you need to developing managers and people so they can understand what their team setup is like and giving them the opportunity to grow. And like we said before, giving them the bike with the tailwind rather than the headwind. Yes. So Asan, coming back to you, when I'm thinking about how people are going to use this concept, which it's a very clever concept, it makes sense. But I've never heard anyone ever talk about their unfair advantage. Ash gives some good examples of how to go about thinking about it, the framework and so on. But how do we make sure people start thinking about their careers as a process of identifying and managing their unfair advantage because nobody talks about that. If mm. I speak to clients anywhere in the world, they want to know how to be promoted. They want to know how to be the best banker. But no one ever says, unless we tell them, you know, we use the word comparative advantage, similar concept. But how do you get people start thinking about identifying, nurturing, balancing their unfair advantages? Because it's not a common conversation. Yeah, absolutely. The best way, the best way for anything, I've realized that this is in, in any project or endeavor of self-improvement, self-development, there is, or even just improvement or development of anything, there's always the first step, which is awareness. And if you're improving yourself, or you're developing your own career, it's self-awareness. So one of the biggest themes running through our book is self-awareness. You yeah. have to be Get to know thyself, as, as the ancient Greek Stoics said, all the big philosophers said, know thyself. And it's so much easier said than done. It, it takes such a long time. It took me a hell of a long time to understand what were my real strengths, what were my real circumstances. One thing that is actually kind of thought about to an extent is strengths, like internal talents, yes. skills, strengths. But people don't look at it as holistically as they should. One thing that's unique about our book that we've noticed, and this is why we wrote it, is this gap in the market of people talking about circumstances. It's almost as if people are writing business books, not talking, you know, not even acknowledging that people's circumstances are different. They just say, oh, you know, if they can do it, you can do it. And it's like, no, not always. It depends on the circumstances. And that's why we talk about the reality growth mindset. And we talk about how you need to take a realistic look at what you have going for you, including who you know, where you're based, including how you come across, what people assume about you, all these things which can be uncomfortable topics. But, you know, people judge a book by its cover, unfortunately. And that's not just visually. That's like how you sound and how you, you know, what subculture you seem like you're part of, what job description you use for yourself. These are all things, and that's, these are what I'm alluding to, are status unfair advantages. These are all things that are so important for people to, first of all, become aware of. And then once you're aware of it, you can start to develop it. But the step number one is always awareness. You can't, you can't solve a problem that you're not aware exists, right? Um, and it's the same with just improving something, even if it's not necessarily a problem and you just want to improve. It's the same thing. 
So I would do all the things I can to get to know what am I good at? What gives me energy? What do I find easy and fun that other people find difficult? You know, what to me seems like nothing special, but other people are like, wow, can you do that for me as well? Oh, you're really good at this thing. So you can look at feedback externally from people you work with, colleagues, bosses, friends, family, and you can also get to know yourself internally of what gives me energy. What do I feel excited to work on? What do I think about? What am I passionate about? You know, as as kind of difficult as to know sometimes what passion is, like what is it that energizes? Me? These are the areas that I start off so that I can start to determine what my own unfair advantages are, become aware of it, and then start to develop and improve it. So this sounds as if it's something that the person has to drive themselves. It's not something they can go to some expert and say, hey, can you tell me what my unfair advantage is? It's not going to work that way. Uh, I'm a big fan of coaching. You're, you're absolutely right. You can't get told what your unfair advantages are. And yeah. I kind of had, there's a paradigm shift from the typical thing, which is that you think that you add value by giving advice, right? So let's say as a consultant or as an expert in, in some area, a management consultant, let's say, you add value by giving information, right? And that's normal, you know, teaching is about giving information, you know, consulting, etc. But really the real shift becomes when you learn about coaching. So yeah. at first coaching sounded like, it didn't sound very valuable to me because it was like, oh, a coach just asks you questions, whereas a consultant gives you answers. I'd definitely rather be a consultant. And it was only until, you know, a couple of years ago when I got into coaching myself and started to understand what it is, started to hire executive coaches for myself, started to really see the value of being asked questions. And being asked questions allows you to introspect. It allow, it's like the shortcut. It's like having the unfair advantage of money because if you want a good coach, it's not some, it is an investment. Yes. That allows you to then have somebody there to ask you, you know, what, you know, ask you the questions that allow you to introspect, to go into yourself. And they also can reflect things and say things back to you to help you to see things that sometimes you can't read the, the label from inside the bottle, as they say. Yeah. These are all areas that I think, so to answer your question, yeah, I think that nobody can tell you what yours are, but it can often help to be asked what yours are and to go through a process of coaching. But even without a coach, you can sort of do that through journaling, let's say, or you can do it through having an accountability partner or an account. I started my first business with an accountability buddy. Before then, I was too scared to start. I kept double thinking myself but until i had somebody who was on a similar journey and we could encourage each other because it's such a lonely journey I was a solo founder then i was able to do it so i think these are all kind of tools that we can use to help ourselves that's a great answer and yourself ash what advice do you have for people going through this journey as they are thinking about what is their unfair advantage i think being self-aware is really important and um, getting feedback 360 feedback from the people you work with in the past is really helpful too and uh, the more honest the feedback, the better for you. Because sometimes you don't even know the expertise that you have. Sometimes as an expert, you don't even realize how good you are yes. at something. And you think everyone should know this. But you might be really good at it. And something someone might be saying, actually, you're very good at that. So I think understanding your personality is really important. Getting a view of how you feel in personality, what energizes you. Then getting a feel of what, when you've worked with teams, what have teams said that you really excelled at? Because that will then give, them, give you an idea of where to start looking. And then you can start using the Miles framework from the book, sit down, start journaling and looking at the different pillars that we've created and start looking deeper into those. And going, okay, where do I see myself as an unfair advantage, which is specifically uh, in this pillar that we've created? And the, the beauty of the unfair advantage is not to just look at all the good things. You know, like when people are being hired, the CV is used to be the, the good thing that people looked at and everything is good. I've yes. done this, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, I'm amazing. But actually... One of the unfair advantages is to look at the opposite side of it, things that didn't work out. Because adversity is a great way and how you overcome adversity is a great positioning tool for you in the marketplace um, as an employee and as also as a founder. Because if you've overcome challenges, that's really interesting. Because everybody knows when you do good stuff, but what about when you overcome challenges? So have a look back in your life and see where you've had adversity in your life and how did you overcome those ad uh, the, that adversity? And then how do you share that? You know, like, how do you share... Uh, projects we didn't work out and the learnings from those uh, and then share those with people so that people can learn from them. What did you learn from it? Those are much more interesting uh, facets of building your unfair advantage. And I think also it's really important when you develop your unfair advantages to remain authentic because a lot of people want to mimic yeah. other people 
a role model of the people. That's just fine to be a, have a role model, but don't copy them. This is why we say everybody's unique and special in the book. Everyone's got a unique set of unfair advantages and they've compounded over time. And your unfair advantages, you'll get new ones over your life when you start off from, you know, when you've been born right through to where you are in your career. So think about everything right from where you were born, which city you were born in, to, um, and, and right through to what experience you're getting now. These all compound and that all becomes your unfair advantages, what makes you so unique uh, at what you do. And then once you know some of these unfair advantages is to develop what we call a personal brand out of it because your personal brand is going to be, able, be your unique positioning that you create in the marketplace for who you are as an employee, as a consultant, as a business person. And then that's what brings your authentic story through, your unfair advantages through, and then also uh, makes people want to work with you specifically with a project or a business. I like that example. It reminds me when I used to interview people to join consulting firms, you know, usually a senior partner, I'll do the final round interview. And a lot of them have been or had been involved in startups and it's listed prominently on their resumes. And when you ask them to tell me about the startup experience, they'll tell you all the positive things, mm -hmm. but they'll never tell you the most obvious thing, which is that it failed, which is why they're applying for a job, right? Mm -hmm. And the few people who are honest and tell me the things like the startup failed for these reasons. This is what I learned from it. This is what I could have done better. This is what I realized is a gap in my knowledge or how I build out my team. It's a far more authentic conversation. You actually trust that person. You realize they're also self-aware. They have, they have introspection. They're not simply thinking about how to package this positively. Which brings me to my next question. Whenever you look at any announcement made by companies, startup pitches and so on, there's a tendency to present perfection as if they know how to solve the problem already and it's, it's just so positive as opposed to saying, I need funding to try to figure out how to solve the problem. And there is a difference here. So my question is, how do you distinguish between people who have a realistic understanding of the problem or people that are presenting a solution as such? And if the question is a little bit unclear, I can rephrase it, but, but let's start with Asan on this one. Um so how do you know whether they know what the problem is or whether their solution is just a fancy thing that doesn't have a problem? Is that the question? Yeah, let me unpack that a little bit because it may be a bit unclear. So when I'm dealing with whether it's clients on the corporate side or we have clients who leave consulting, investment banking, want to launch businesses, and they always ask for our advice. And I noticed there's two sort of buckets of two broad ways of categorizing them. One is where someone is absolutely convinced they have the answer. But it's not clear to me the answer. To me, it sounds as if you need to first build something to test it before you even know what the real problem is. Because you, you just feel this is a problem, but you haven't put anything into the market to see if people are paying for it. And then there's the mm -hmm. other group who are very clear that says, you know what, we think this is a problem. We think we have a way to fix it. So we're looking for money to try to figure it out. So when dealing with these two groups, which one do you think is the most successful one? Okay. Definitely, I think it's one more than the other. And that's the one which has accurately defined the problem. Yeah. It's much more important than trying to nail a solution because one must come before the other. It's far too common and i'm sure you've seen this michael yeah. of people having a solution that's looking for a problem yes so, and it's just the worst thing ever and it's often the technologists who are doing this it's all the technician ones who they have some kind of cool technology they want to use and they're not sure what to use it for and they say oh maybe it can be used for this and it's just something yeah. they've thought up and they haven't tested it and it really is as you've alluded to already it's all about testing and seeing, is there a market for this? Are people willing to pay for this? Is it a painful problem? This takes discovery. This takes, you know, customer development, as they call it. Um, it takes iterating. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's required work. It's the validation process. It takes time to validate, but it's very, very important. Yeah. And your thoughts on this, Ash? Yeah, I think um, uh, most people have an idea and they have it in their brain and they don't go to market to test it out quick enough. And I like people who've spoken to customers, really understood their customers and, their, and the challenges that the customers are facing rather than the actual problem or the solution. Um, because that will come at a point when you get the insight on how to develop that um, the solution through a specific problem that you come through from customer discovery. So I would say, 
develop an MVP, go to market before you start talking to lots of people about your idea um, who are not your customers, then you're getting the wrong feedback loop. You, you know, there's no point in me talking about an idea that's going to solve something for my feet to somebody who doesn't have feet issues, for example, right? Or someone who just didn't, gen general person. It's very important to get feedback of your idea in the niche that you want to go after. Yeah. So develop an MVP, a minimum viable product, go out there and try and get some traction. And this is where entrepreneurs start to think differently about you know, the, this issue of failing and succeeding. In the early days of a startup, you want to fail fast so you can learn fast. And so any traction, good and bad, is useful to have because that's going to allow you to understand what works and what doesn't work. I want to hear from people who say, you know what, we found an insight. This was a problem that we saw. And we went out to market with a couple of different MVPs. And this one didn't work. This one failed. This one had a little bit of traction. But actually, we landed on the final one, which actually started to get traction and customers were willing to pay for it. That's much more interesting as somebody sharing an idea about being confident in it than someone just sharing an idea that's on paper. Um, and that's the problem with um, uh, MBAs and uh, management consultancy in general. We're good at writing loads of documents and PowerPoints and stuff. But the reality is it's when you go in the market that decides who's going to win. And if you can't tell me about the market and how it's reacting to you, I'm already not convinced about you knowing enough about the idea. And the, as you say very well, it's the reaction means you have an MVP, minimum viable product, get it out there. And we talk about the word iteration, but iterations basically means many more opportunities to learn. So as we get to the tail end of the podcast, I do want to touch on something here, and it's more advice for the listeners. As you probably have experienced with some people you're working with, we also have clients who I think are very capable. But I hear this very often from very capable people that they just have no unfair advantage. And sometimes I have long coaching conversations with people. It's hard to get them. We eventually succeed in getting them past the mindset of believing they don't have an advantage. But what would be your advice? And we'll start with you, Asan, and then we'll get to you, Ash. How do you work with someone? What advice do you have to help someone get past that mental block whereby they just feel they have nothing unique to offer? And I've seen some very talented clients squander years of their lives because they don't believe in themselves. And then one day the penny drops it clicks and they realize, you know what? I do have an unfair advantage. This is it. I'm going to build my life around it. But do you have any tips on how to compress that learning curve? Yeah, I think the best way to help somebody who doesn't believe they have any unfair advantages is to ask them about their lives, about their experiences, about how they've been able to get out of situations before. In other words, ask them how they've been successful, however small in something, how they've achieved something, how they've, you know, gotten through some bad odds at something in the past. And that helping them to talk about it and remi reminding them of it puts them in the mood, puts them in the, the positive appreciation side. I think it helps them to get to, in other words, it helps them get to gratitude. You know, the more you can take somebody, and sometimes it's harder with some than others, is to get them to the point of gratitude because it's, the, it's almost like a, not to sound woo, but it's an energetic thing that when you have that kind of feeling of gratitude and positivity, then you can remember, it's almost like the memories get unlocked of times where you've overcome bad odds, where you've been able to pull yourself out of bad situations, where you've been able to achieve things, when you've been able to do things. And I think it's really important to get back into that frame because if you're thinking, oh, woe is me, everything is bad for me, then you're never going to all there's nothing special about me and I'm just too average and ordinary, which is another way of saying, woe is me and I'm a victim, yeah. right? It's about shifting them away from that. And it's what we do during the, throughout the book. As we wrote the book, me and Ash were really focused on this idea of not having a victim mindset. Even if you've been a victim, like you can actually be a victim, but not to focus on, on that side, but actually focus on something that's more empowering, what you have going for you already. So one of the, the subtitle for our book is you already have what it takes to succeed. And that's because number one, you define success for yourself. You don't compare yourself to outliers and people with crazy circumstances yeah. and situations. So therefore you can define success for yourself and you can achieve it because you can turn disadvantages into advantages. Something that we haven't touched on in this conversation is that what seems like a disadvantage can be turned into an advantage with the right mindset. So having very little money, and maybe you can ask Ash about this because he particularly was very good at this, can make you more creative. Having little money 
makes you more resourceful because necessity is the mother of invention and having constraints actually can help you breed kind of some creativity and resourcefulness. So the best way, the quickest way is to remind people and ask people again, it's coaching questions of when have you been successful in the past? What do people say about you that you is going for you? You know, just to take people through that so they can remember and remind themselves of what unfair advantages that they do have. That's a very good technique. I've seen that used before with, and we also use it and it works very well. So I see you've teed up Ash for, for his part about how to make do with very little. Do you want to give us some insights there, Ash? <laughs> yeah, that, well, why don't I uh, go through the, uh, the Miles framework briefly and I'll explain to you some of my uh, disadvantages that I've turned into advantages. So I didn't have any higher education. I dropped out of college, so I didn't feel entitled. And I, instead, I taught myself how to read books and build my own expertise. So I built my expertise and that became really powerful for me. I didn't have any money, money when I was growing up, but it made me more uh, creative and felt like I had nothing to lose when I was starting projects. Um, and so they call me a growth hacker in businesses because I can use little money to do a lot. And that only happened because I had little money when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, in terms of intelligence, I didn't have the book smart that people think, you know, the degrees and the qualifications and the MBAs, but I had street smarts uh, and good social emotional and creative intelligence that came from that i didn't have the best location i was you know born and bred in birmingham which is a second city which is the automotive city but luckily i moved to london where the internet industry was growing and media was growing and i got into the right opportunities i didn't have the status uh, but i built mine up building an expertise um, and also started to look at my inner status the stories i told myself about myself um, and reflecting on those in a positive way uh, and bringing them out as my authentic self because my lack has taught me a lot about um, having abundance uh, and then also working with people who have the scarcity mindset around that, up to the mental block around, oh no, I don't have anything because that comes from a scarcity mindset of not having anything. And that's where Hassan mentioned that actually the ultimate aim of our book is to allow people to be grateful for, for what they have and not what they don't have. I like that. That's very interesting. You know, what, what I like speaking to both of you guys is that you're giving advice on things, not that you've lived through, you are living through it. Oftentimes when I'm interviewing people, they're talking about something they've experienced many years ago and then they're reflecting on it. But you're going through it right now. So it's almost as if the frameworks and methodologies and tools that you are advising other people to use, you're using them right now. And I'm sure you're going to a meeting sometime during the week. We're going to be applying those tools as well. So the feedback is real time as opposed to something that's you know, aged but hasn't been able to keep up with what you're going through at the moment. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you for being on the podcast. I enjoyed it immensely. And I think our listeners are going to enjoy it as well. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us on. So we're going to wrap up here and we'll be in touch with you over the next few days in terms of how we're going to release this. And we'll obviously have you back at some point on the show. Thank you again. Enjoy your time in London. Thanks, thank Michael. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.